Welcome back, everybody. Hope you can hear me. So uh, this morning, we heard from Jonathan Stray about the ethics of ubiquitous monitoring in today's, uh, in today's, in today's environment. We we're talking primarily about monitoring by others, by governments, by fishers and hackers and the like. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to tee up monitoring by journalists themselves. So it's a, a little bit of a turn, but certainly um, an area for ripe for ethics discussion. So I'm delighted to introduce uh, John Keefe from WNYC. And those of you from UW-Madison in the room should know that John and I were competing editors of the Badger Herald and Daily Cardinal during our time together as undergraduates. <laughs> we won the softball game my senior year. <laughs> Cece Way from ProPublica, whose work I've long admired, and I feel like I'm sitting in the shadow of a rock star. And then finally, Fergus Pitt, who uh, is doing some work uh, together with me, and uh, Lucas Graves from our uh, department and a couple of other people with a, um, a, an entire project for the Tau Center at Columbia University, where he is a fellow, on the ethical and legal implications of censors for journalism. So welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to get started. Uh, just to give everybody a little bit of background and and maybe geekify the room altogether. Uh, what are we talking about when we're talking about tools for watching, sensing, and scraping, which um, are words that we probably use every single day in our lives, but not everybody would. I got interested in this topic when um, I uh, had a conversation with a fellow geek named Matt Waite, who was a journalist and um, is now a professor at the University of Nebraska, and I believe is watching us live right now. <laughs> about what you might be able to use a drone for in journalism. This morning we heard Eric Lickplow talking about uh, drones along with torture devices and that sort of thing. That's not what they're used for in journalism. But think about using a drone to take radiation sensors and put them aloft um, after a nuclear accident and verify whether the government is actually giving um, reliable uh, readings of radiation levels. So there are ways that we can use sensors like that, whether they're on a on a drone or um, soil uh, sensors that USA Today drove into the ground around old factories and began to sense lead levels. So they can be drone mounted, not drone mounted, but they're used to sense in those ways. And they can give us the kinds of data that we used to have to rely on other sources for. Um, then scraping refers to writing some interesting code to automatically grab information primarily, almost entirely from websites. So uh, I had a student who Wrote, a, um, wrote some code to scrape journalismjobs.com so that uh, he could compare salaries in various parts of the country and decide where he wanted to go. But quite crafty, I thought. So those are some um, you know, just very basic uses of the kinds of tools that we'll be talking about. And those are all positive uses. I think they're empowering uses. But you don't have to think hard to find ethically fraught kinds of um, uses. So whatever I think about that, I think about the words drones, paparazzi, and Kardashian, and immediately <laughs> I think about some areas where we ought to have some grave concerns. So we're going to start off digging into this with my asking each of you to talk about um, some uses that you've either seen or imagined, and what are some of the issues that they raise. So let's begin with John. Cool. Um, and just as an extension to the discussion about what we are talking about, we have a couple of pictures to show you. Um, in my world, what we've been experimenting with is less of these sensors that you can, might go out be, and be able to buy commercially, um, which can also be useful commercial air sensors and commercial radiation detectors, things like that. Um, we've been, at WNYC, we've been experimenting with something that's a little bit more homegrown. And now these are these prototyping computers. They're, they fit in the palm of your hand. Let's see if we have. OK, that's a lot bigger than what it actually is. It's, this is smaller than your cell phone. It's a little tiny board. And with your computer, you can program these. These are called Arduinos. Um, and they're hobbyist computers prototyping platforms where you can build something. This Arduino right here, depending on where you buy it, is about 20, 20 bucks. And sometimes it's cheaper. Sometimes some versions, I bought a version of that for $9 um, on sale the other day. Um, these are very inexpensive little computers that you can attach sensors to, and you can attach communication systems to, and you can actually, they're designed to basically build things that haven't been thought of before. It turns out to be incredibly easy, and there are people, if you're not already doing this, there are people in your community who are playing with these things. So we've been playing with them. We used um, a system a lot like this for a project where we invited people to take soil readings in their neighborhood or in their backyard to detect when cicadas were going to emerge last year. 
because cicadas come out when the temperature um, eight inches down is 64 degrees. That's when they come out. So it was a, a, a project we thought we could get people involved in. And we thought we might be able to convince a couple dozen people to build sensors. We ended up having 800 different people take temperature readings, either with something like this or with a um, soil thermometer that they bought themselves. 800 people um, and um, uh, about double that number total readings. Um, and that was an incredible citizen science little experiment. Um, something I did more recently, that's my thumb, so you can see how, <laughs> there goes my transmitter. <laughs> that's my thumb, and that's a uh, tiny version of an Arduino, so that's this big. I took that, stuck it in a sock, and I tied it to my wrist. Um, what it consists of is a little memory card, a little Arduino, and an XYZ orientation um, detector. And so what I was able to do successfully is track when I was sleeping. Um, it was logging every minute whether or not the motion had changed, and I was able to show that, yeah, I could track my own sleep with a homemade sensor. So if you imagine, then from there, what could you do with that? And um, Katie asked, um, are there situations where you've thought of, dreamed of things that you wanted to do but haven't been able to pull off? So one of the things that I uh, have wanted to do, I'll tell you two stories, using things that almost exactly like this, I wanted to be able to um, put 100 of these in every sta uh, subway station in the New York City um, transit system, the subway <laughs> system, right? And so then maybe we could, if you've ever been on the New York City subway <laughs> in the summertime, it gets very, very, very hot. So can we actually track over the entire system how hot it gets at every station over the course of a couple of days? This is totally doable. Using something exactly like this instead in, with a temperature sensor instead of an orientation sensor, totally doable. Um, the problem is, one, it could be illegal because you, uh, depending on how you interpret the rules of the MTA, um, you can't stick this to anything in the subway. And two, before you debate whether or not you're going to get arrested, um, there's a not zero chance that somebody is going to find this and think it's something nefarious and you'll shut down, you might shut down the subway station or entire <laughs> subway line. That is actually what prevented us from doing this. This is not a, this is a solvable thing you could do, except for this little problem of maybe disrupting millions of commuters in the morning. And we thought as um, a public service that didn't really qualify and, and it, it's probably unethical. Um, the other thing that um, I have also wanted to do is to get, um, so at WNYC we have a very loyal, uh, it's a public radio station, very loyal listenership, and they will often partake in projects that may seem outlandish. And what I thought would be really cool is that you could just put an audio sensor, not a recording device per se, but just something like you can measure temperature, you can measure the amount of decibels in, a, in, a, in an area. And could you stick, have people just stick these to their windows, right, in apartments throughout a neighborhood in, in Manhattan or part of Queens or something, and actually be able to see how things, how sounds move through a neighborhood. Like, um, garbage trucks, when are the garbage trucks moving through? When are the ambulances coming through? What are, what are these, uh, do the, do, does the level of noise actually match the complaint levels to the city? Things like that. Um, I really wanna do this, I still wanna do this. Everybody's really, really skittish about this because could you detect something with a noise sensor that is private, right? If this is on your window in your living room, can you, it, it, would we, might we collect data that would say something about you that you wouldn't want us to collect? Um, and the answer probably is yes. Um, so that's a, another sort of uh, t a sensor investigation that we've thought about doing um, that's kind of on hold and we have some other ideas for sound sensors. But the, I think, I hope give you a quick example of what we're talking about here. So safety and privacy already um, raised. CC, what are some projects that you've either done or thought about, and what issues do you see there that relate to ethics? Yeah, so there's one project in particular that ProPublica has done that's really good for this question, which is we, uh, when the presidential election primaries were going on four years ago, um, ProPublica did a project called Message Machine. Uh, basically, what we were trying to figure out is based on what each campaign knew about you as a supporter, if you signed up to say, you know, I support so-and-so, send me emails, right? And they'll send you an email saying, please donate $5. Um, 
please donate $50, right? We're trying to figure out, depending on what they know about you, do they send you a slightly different message? Or do they send you a vastly different message? So we asked people to forward on to us all of the emails they were getting. And we, of course, wanted to know for ourselves, right, what are the emails, let's sign up. And for almost every single one, there was no issue. But then there was one specific campaign, I don't remember which one it was, but in order to sign up for their emails, you had to check a box. And that box said something like, I will support this candidate in the election. Right, and as journalists, ProPublica decided we can't sign up for this particular campaign listserv because we weren't willing, whoever it was that was scraping or analyzing the emails that we were getting to say, this is, this is me as a journalist, right? We would put in our real name uh, and we are not willing to check that box, right? So we had to depend on other people sending us those emails and that was the one we couldn't get ourselves. And that you know, idea of how do we identify ourselves as journalists in person is very easy because I'm a person, you're a person, and I can easily tell you, hey, I'm a journalist, this is what I'm doing, you know that, we're talking now, and you know what follows. But online, it's very different because a lot of times you don't need to disclose that part, nor is it necessary sometimes, right? Like many of the campaigns did not ask that we support the candidate in order to get these emails. So that is, uh, you know, identity and your identity as a journalist and being truthful and presenting that is an issue online, especially, you know, in scraping because a lot of times no one even asks you for your identity. All right, and Fergus. Okay, so um, one of the things that we've found incredibly useful over the last year is to kind of set a very broad context um, for this. Um, the work that we're doing is research into how sensors can be used as reporting tools. Um, so there are some, so there are some thing, broad themes that are happening in the world and in journalism that are, that are making this an interesting area. Um, one is that you've got an incredible hunger for data amongst journalists. Um, data journalism is becoming a big thing, but even, um, even beyond that, the, competitive, uh, the, the, the competition for information is, is obviously very, very great. So that's happening. Data is increasingly useful. Um, you've got availability of technology which is rapidly becoming cheaper and for a certain amount of money you can do more with that and sensors and the ability to process data is part of that. Meanwhile computational skills are becoming more and more common in newsrooms, um, especially at the top of the industry. Um, some of those computational skills are also matched by the ability to do what the kinds of things that John does which is, which is make sensors. Um, so you've got a, you know, you've got a supply of data and skills and then you've got a demand on the, on the journalism side for data. Um, look, the other thing that I'd say is that this, this kind of activity is relatively new, so there's, there's a great deal of variability in our kind of research set, so it's, it's early on. Um, so with that broad context, the kinds of ways that we're seeing journalists use sensors um, as reporting tools kind of fall into three broad categories. Um, there's the work that, that John does, which is make, you know, deciding, well, we've got a particular story that we want to tell. Can we develop some technology that helps us gather data for that, the electronic prototyping uh, type of work? Um, then you've got the kind of work that's been going on for a little bit longer, and it's the, it tends to be investigative and environmental journalists who are using technology to, to gather data, and a lot of the time they're using technology that's already used in industry. Um, there's a wonderful example by a journalist called uh, uh, Dinah Cappiello, who was at the Houston Chronicle back then, and she was investigating air pollution near oil refineries using the um, badges that, that um, uh, factory workers use to monitor their own intake. And she was trying to say, okay, these, these communities that are near the fence lines, are they, are they being exposed to, to harmful amounts of, of, uh, of air pollution? Alison Young at USA Today used um, handheld x-ray guns to take soil samples. So that's the, that's the example where you've got people using commercially available sensors um, or monitors to collect data for their investigation. That's, that's one category. Um, as well, as more of our world is recorded by different types of sensors, um, there are opportunities there, especially if you've got civic systems. Um, uh, in 2013, the Sun Sentinel won a Pulitzer Prize for their work, um, making public res records requests of the data that had been produced by sensors at toll booths along highways. They proved that police speeding was endemic, widespread, and tolerated in, in the Florida police forces. Um, 
Washington Post last year um, foiled the data from uh, a network of audio sensors that the Washington DC police force had set up to detect and locate gunfire. Uh, so that was sensors that are owned by cities or civic institutions that can also be used for investigations. Um, and the data from sensors on satellites kind of falls into that category as well. Um, so those are three, three kind of broad, broad kind of types of uses of sensors. But the thing is, and this is where it kind of comes into the ethical questions and, the, and some of the, the legal questions, um, the production and interpretation of this data is not simple. Um, for many journalists, these skills are new. Uh, so there are lots and lots of ways to overstate what you think you know um, in terms of what is found. It might be the toxins that are in the environment or the, the health effects of those toxins um, or the behaviour of people. So you get this data. It looks real, it looks tangible, but you may be overstating what you know. So that's the kind of accuracy side of it. Um, and then there's, then there's more of the kind of privacy and surveillance stuff that comes up. As we're collecting more data and producing more data, we may be inadvertently releasing data that can be used to draw conclusions about people that were not intended or obvious when it was, uh, when, when it was done. Um, so the, the final one that I've mentioned that these guys haven't already mentioned is that there's always, there, there seems to be a temptation when using technology to collect information to keep your reporting at that remove. Um, the satellite sensing folk um, talk about this and say, okay, well, you need to ground truth something. You need to go in there and get the, collect the human nuance, um, try and understand the people between the pixels. Um, and I think that's, that's very important. And of course, it, makes, it, it gives you the opportunity to put a lot more emotion in your story as well, which makes it a better story. Um, so that's, I suppose, and look, the other thing I'd say, there's a lot of journalists who are, who are using, this, using these techniques really well. Um, so what we do at the Tau Centre is try and look at those and, and analyse those so that we can communicate them out and, and use them for students and other people in the industry. Okay. That's the ideal segue to my next question, which I'm going to pose to you, John, which is that I was on a panel recently talking about drones and ethics, uh, drones in journalism and ethics and raised some of those exact questions about you know, what distance does, how it changes our perspective, whether we are on the ground trying to find truth. And I was challenged by someone who said, look, this is nothing new. These are all our traditional ethics that will just apply here. Uh, do you, how, do, how do you see that playing out? What principles do apply here and, and how are they shifting? And what new principles do we need to think about? Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. And um, I think that um, as we heard this morning, history is full of these challenges and technology marches forward. And I mean, the most um, intensely ubiquitous and uh, uh, crazy sensor is the camera, right? I mean, cameras are amazing sensors. Forget the other 16 sensors that are on your phone, by the way, <laughs> um, which we can talk more about. Um, and, you know, I, we, we're talking this morning about images and photographs and you know the security of your image. Um, you know, people talk about journalism and drones, and sure, you could you can put a camera on a drone, um, so then can, you can fly it up to somebody's bedroom window. Well, is that really different than just using a telephoto lens for the same purpose? And did the same ethical thing come into play? What happens with a drone is that you could also, that thing could actually land on somebody or crash into a crowd and hurt somebody. And then you have the ethics of that. So um, sometimes when we get into these ethics of, of sensors and drones and things, I, I also feel the same way that, no, really we just have to um, apply the existing, whatever ethics your organization feels are correct. Um, that you have to figure out a way to apply that. The bigger problem, I think, and we're hearing more about that from Jonathan and others, is that knowing when you're violating those ethical um, guidelines that you may be following, um, you know, if you take a picture of somebody, if you followed a fugitive and he lets you take your picture, take their picture, and then you post the picture, and the picture is encoded with the latitude and longitude of the picture, which happened, right? You all know this happened. And and then the authorities can come in and find the fugitive. You've just exposed your source. Did you know you were doing that? That's the bigger problem. If you, I think 
the issue becomes, as we we're using more technologies, whether it's our phones or sensors, thinking, trying to think about what ethical things are, what existing ethical issues do we just have to remember to apply or know to apply? Um, I think that that becomes the bigger issue. Um, things like misrepresentation or hidden microphones or hidden cameras, we're already dealing with those issues. And I think that they can be extended, depending on the situation, um, to new forms of technology. I don't think it's, I think the bigger challenge is do we actually understand what we're using? And I think that's a great segue. Uh, Cece, I, I know you and I both share the same interest in what Jonathan was talking about this morning and how, how vulnerable are we as we are now collecting? We're scraping, we're sensing, we're collecting this. How vulnerable are we? What steps, you know, is this an ethics call to action to become security experts ourselves? How do we avoid uh, that kind of hacking, phishing, and surveillance? Right, so uh, I think that it is very difficult if you're going to do this kind of stuff and then publish whatever it is that you scrape or sense um, that you, there, there needs to be a certain amount of baseline knowledge, right? That you have to educate yourself. Like Jonathan was advocating for earlier, if you want to do this because you need to ultimately, I mean, some stuff, there isn't sensitive data involved, right? And so if you publish it, like if I, uh, if I asked all of my users to do something and they all gave me something and they were like, yes, use this and that's part of our agreement, no worries there. Um, but ProPublica recently did a project in which we were trying to detect what was deleted off of the internet by, the, um, by basically a social media company in China, right? And they were censoring their users, right? And so in this case, we come up with a lot of ethical issues in terms of like, how much do I know? And that directly influences how much I can protect these people, right? So the example really is that we were collecting images of people who were posting them publicly, but they were being deleted off of the service by the service itself, right? So at some point, they were public. Now, I guess they're kind of not, because you can't find them on the site anymore. Um, do, these, do I know enough about technology, if I'm republishing these images, one, to know what's on the images themselves, what's in the metadata? Do I know how to see it? If I do, do I know how to get rid of it? Um, or do I know how to republish it in a, in a way online that does not contain all of that original identifying information? Um, all of these images, for us, happen to also have stamped on top of them. Uh, the username of the person who had posted it, right? And so at ProPublica, I think it was like, I don't know, probably seven days before the team published this, and we were like, how do we get rid of all of them? Because uh, there's a setting on the service in which like, if you upload something, your name gets put on it, but you can tell it, I want it to be in the bottom right corner, mm. in the center, on the left, right, really big. And so it was all over the place, and we had hundreds and hundreds of images. And so we sort of wrote our own computer algorithm to go through all the images and just blur out the entire bottom. And then we looked through all, every single one to make sure if your username was smack dab in the middle, that we would manually blur that out so that people wouldn't be able to see it, right? And then um, people who worked on the project then gave a sample image to somebody else on our team and said, you try to unblur this and figure out whose username is on this image. Can you do it? Right, and you can imagine immediately, like, if we were limited in our knowledge of how to do every single one of those technical steps, it would be very difficult for us to say, okay, I'm confident that publishing this image will not allow somebody else to then take it and then find out whose it was. Right, and so all of that is dependent on the fact that I know enough. Um, and this is just with, like, image processing. Right, like depending on what you're scraping and what you're trying to publish, it's all about like, what can I find out to help me protect my source? And so there are a lot of things out there now that people are trying to create that are tools to help this kind of thing. So for example, um, news organizations can set up dead drops with the help of the organization that makes this kind of software so that someone who wants to leak documents to you can make it so that you as the organization don't know who did it, right? So I only get the document, but I don't know who exactly gave it to me. Right, and that comes with its own ethical issues in terms of like, do I trust this document, right? And you can go through your own process for how do I verify this is a real document. But at that point, even if the government were to say, who gave this to you, you would say, well, I don't know. Right, I don't have that communication that links me with the source, uh, unless you're already talking to this person, you just don't know they used it. Um, but that way you can say, I, I don't know who this is, right? Yeah. Fergus, I, I know you and I both share a concern that one of the challenges for these 
applying traditional ethics to these new uses of ever new technology, is that we are dramatically expanding what we collect, where we collect it, when we collect it, from who, and how long we store it. Um, what does that mean for the relationship between journalists, news organizations, and the communities they cover? And, you know, what kind of power differentials are involved there? I guess one of the early things that I'd say is that it is very early days and we kind of don't know yet how this is, how this is going to play out. Um, an example, however, of where a couple of news organisations have negotiated that um, the, the new capacity that they have to collect information with the communities that they're collecting information around, again, comes from the Houston Chronicle and, and USA Today. Um, in both of those examples, you had environmental journalists using new tools to go out and collect data um, about pollution that had potential health effects um, in communities. And in both cases, they, actually, they were, they were uh, uh, relatively, um, relatively poor communities. Uh, and the decisions, that, the decisions that the journalists made were partially informed by the fact that they were talking to um, universities who had gone through these kinds of processes before and what the, what the people from the universities would say is, well, when you collect this information, if you go and take a lead soil sample at a house, you've got a responsibility to not just produce this, inf or not just take this information and use the information and not tell the people who are living in that area, but also give the people who live there the opportunity to understand the information know how to act on the information. But the journalists also had to tread a very f fine line. They're not the right people to be kind of giving health advice uh, to, um, to the residents. What they did was they produced up sheets where they'd take their soil sample, they'd, they'd put in the readings, and they'd say, this is, what the, this is what the data showed about your house. These are the sources where you can go and collect more information about it. But the key thing, was that they were not treating the information that they were collecting as just theirs. They were kind of going, OK, well, you people have a stake in this information, so we're going to share this information with you. Those are really specific examples where you're talking about environmental data collection. That power relationship might be different if you were reporting on people with power. Um, but I think that's an interesting example where you're taking a principle of openness about the information that you're collecting, which is not necessarily something that is traditional for journalists. I think that's one of the key, one of the key challenges to this, and you see it playing out in conversations, like on the NICAR listserv, as the FAA has gotten increasingly feisty about shutting down journalistic uses uh, of drones for primarily recording, but also for sensing. You have a lot of news organizations saying, well, I have an absolute First Amendment right to do this, and the FAA can butt out, which people like Jason, Bob, and I will say, well, not so much. But how are news organizations opening, if they are, opening these conversations up to the communities they cover? You know, people aren't sitting still for the surveillance um, by the NSA. I don't think they're going to sit still for surveillance by news organizations either. Are we being, are we open to that challenge? Are we hearing from communities that might be suspicious of those activities? One thing that I just kind of say on that is that um, Josh Stearns makes a really good point that we're entering into a new area where, where people are using new tools in new, new ways. The legislative process tends to be reactive. So if journalists behave badly, we'll end up with bad legislation. It's bad actors make bad policy. Uh, so we do need to be ready to kind of have this conversation. We need to be really cognizant and put the effort in to make sure that We've thought through what the implications of what we do, because if we get it wrong, we'll get bad laws that restrict what we can do. John, how does your organization open itself up to public input, if you do? Well, I mean, we are, um, in terms of collecting information and things, I, I can speak directly to a project we have going around right now, which is um, sort of spinning out of that little sleep sensor that you saw there. Um, we ended up with a project where we're inviting people to um, track their sleep and see if, you know, can you actually, if we talk about sleep for a month, can you actually get more sleep? Uh, and is that good for you or is that bad for you? Or, and yes, good, more sleep is good for you, just for the record, um, uh, apparently, according to experts. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, we are very, it, it, are we surveilling people? No, we're not, you know, 
we're not asking people, uh, we're not spying on people, we're inviting them to track their sleep. We're holding on to their data. We make a promise that to the, you know, that we're, we're not going to be publishing data in, um, it, 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 in individual cases, we're publishing it in aggregate. Yeah, we're also making it so you can check your own. And there's a lot of security and things that we need to consider there. Um, and um, so, and we're just, I guess we just have an open discussion about it. Um, we try to be really clear about what we're trying to accomplish, what the promise is, what the process is, and then invite people to participate. Um, I think that at least we haven't in our newsroom, uh, not to my knowledge or that I can think of, been in a situation where we're surveilling people um, in, that, in that sort of sense that I think you're describing. Um, surveillance is a big issue in New York City. Uh, the Associated Press had a great uh, Pulitzer Prize winning series on that. Um, and they're, we're, they're installing traffic cameras and they're putting more things, there are more, uh, there's some crazy density of security cameras in New York City. There's a lot of surveillance going on and maybe journalists are going to start getting involved in that. Um, I, we're not doing it in that way, which it, it, that is somehow surreptitious. I do think though you, you exhibit some very positive <laughs> ethical principles in that um, as far as I know, WMIC doesn't engage in secondary uses of data. So when you invite people to be part of your sleep study or to say whether Mayor Bloomberg is right that their streets were cleaned off in this area, which is one of my favorite crowdsourced data projects, the, the mayor was lying. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe misinformed is the better word. Uh, but you don't then take those submissions from them, the emails that they send in, and turn around and solicit them for donations to WNYC. Well, I mean, we, when we collect that data, we give ourselves the possibility to advertise to these people, to solicit subscriptions, and I think it's important to not engage in those secondary uses. Um, I think, so if you interview somebody for a story, about a particular topic, and um, and you t you record that or you take those notes, and then you do and you tell them you're doing a story about said topic, and then maybe you use their quotes, maybe you didn't, and later you're doing a very different story, on kind of the same topic, but it's a very different story, and the context, and, and then you go back to your notes and say, oh, well, I'm going to use Katie's comments about that. I think that there are plenty of newsrooms in this country that would say that's not an ethical use of that interview, that there's, it, you're using that information that you got from your source in a, diff, in a way that was not explicitly said at the outset. Um, so then the ethical consideration there is, do you use that or don't you? Um, and maybe that's a discussion, maybe it's a just flat out rule, whatever. Again, it's the same kind of situation, I think, that if you say this is how you're going to use somebody's data, and then you don't use it that way, and you use it for something dramatically differently. I, you know, I think that's worth an ethical discussion. And if your organization prides itself on being accurate, fair, and ethical, then that's something that you need to talk about. Um, that said, we certainly, in our crowdsourcing projects, we also ask them, do you want to get on our mailing list? And because we're you know, we want to make that because opportunity you're public radio. Too, because we're public radio, <laughs> and we want to have a level of engagement. And so there is that. I mean, you to participate in the sleep project that I just talked about, you have to sign up for a WNYC account. We are now in a relationship with you as a as a organization. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, we, we feel comfortable with that. We're clear about that. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's worth a discussion for sure. The only other concern I'd raise that I don't think that we've hit on yet is um, data merger. So uh, you, rent, you mentioned the Florida Sun Sentinel and getting uh, toll booth data. It, it wouldn't be that much of a leap for the Sun Sentinel to also request DOT um, camera footage. And they could actually merge those data sets and see who was driving through toll booths at what particular speeds at particular times. I'm not sure that that's something I would ever think to engage in, but as data sets become more massive, I think ethical problems arise when we take two disparate ones and put them together. We might, we might find some things that, that people would not intend that we would find. So all those concerns, privacy, safety, you know, a drone being a, a, a flying lawnmower <laughs> launched into the air, um, how we maintain ownership of our data, power differentials, those are all really important 
and I think good concerns to raise, but it's not just peril. There's tremendous promise in these technologies mm -hmm. as well. And so I think there's the affirmative side to ethics um, that we should talk about as well. So, so what are some projects or some uses that you've seen that really represent our ideals of independence, holding power accountable, being accountable to our own audiences, truth telling? I'll open it up to any. I always have the easiest uh, answer to this question. Um, it's so, you know, when you're talking about merging data sets and whatnot, that's like essentially what ProPublica does all the time. Um, and a certain news application that we've made is probably like our, our most popular one and the easiest one to sort of like bring out and tell everyone about. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's called Dollars for Docs. And essentially it is information that we have scraped uh, sometimes obtained and then had to analyze ourselves to get the data out of, let's say, like an image, um, but from various different pharmaceutical companies. Information that they have released to the public, but kind of hidden on their website in a link, you know, from another link and another link that talks to you about the name of a doctor, how much money this pharmaceutical company has given them, and for what categorized reason, like meals, speaking, um, promotion, that kind of stuff. And uh, all of this information is different for different pharmaceutical companies. They provide ranges of dollar amounts sometimes. Some give you a definite amount. Uh, all of the data is in a different format in different places. And we, over many years, have sort of combined all of that into one massive database so that you can search for your doctor's name and find out if both you know, Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca and Pfizer have all given this doctor money and for how much and for doing what, right? And it is not, it's certainly not illegal, and we make this very clear on our site, for a doctor to take this money. But depending on how much money your doctor is getting, right, and then we also provide the user with essentially a list of drugs that this drug company is very famous for producing, right? You as a patient can determine for yourself, like, is this an amount that I'm uncomfortable with? And then we provide you with ways for you to talk to your doctor about it, to have that conversation, and to have that be something that's transparent and part of your relationship with your physician. Right, and so this sort of uh, entire database would not be possible if you were to try to manually create it in any way. Like we needed technology to do this and we needed to scrape sites to do this because pharmaceutical companies weren't going to really aid us in creating this database. Um, and like that has been a very, very useful thing for a lot of people who discover, um, and we obviously write stories from it, and we encourage news organizations from all over the country to write stories about your area, right? And we've found doctors who take in millions of dollars per year, right? And then we write about them specifically. But for every market, right, you can write about physicians in your area. And um, as a result of this and countless other things, it is now coming into this year going to be required that all pharmaceutical companies release this data out to the public. Um, and I think the government is going to try to create their own version of this app that is inclusive of everything. Um, and obviously, like, you can imagine, like, we've gotten certain requests where a doctor will email us and say, well, um, you know, I actually didn't receive this money, but the pharmaceutical company has listed me as doing so, and that was a mistake, right? And I want you to take me off immediately, right? And that makes a lot of sense. It's a very reasonable request. And so what we do is we usually say, um, contact the pharmaceutical company, get them to take it off their site, right? Um, and if they do, then we will immediately change ours, right? And companies have actually been very good at this because they don't want physicians angry at them um, for many reasons. But that's sort of the way that we handle that kind of request. Um, and so there's like, you know, there's a lot of ethical decisions involved, but I think the whole thing has resulted in a very um, net positive in terms of people and their relationship with their doctors. A remarkable addition um, to the ethic of transparency. Right. And someplace where I've always wanted an additional um, sensor approach to that, I, I want to be able to link that to my phone and have an app where I can walk into my doctor's yeah. office and get a readout of, of the payments of all the physicians there. I've always wanted a mobile use well, for that. Well, we have Ooh. kind of <laughs> is if you look up your doctor, there's a little, uh, there's like a checklist that you can print off that has a QR code that your doctor can scan so they can look at themselves when you like go in with your hmm. print sheet of paper that says what they've gotten. Fantastic. So. Fergus, what are some, some that you'd like to mention? So USA Today's work was obviously wonderful. House and Chronicle's work was wonderful. There's, there's, and there will be more studied in an upcoming Tau Centre report. Um, <laughs> one example, which isn't really by journalists per se, but I think deserves a call out, it speaks to the radiation poisoning, um, or the radiation monitoring, rather. 
in uh, Japan after the Fukushima, um, uh, the, the um, nuclear reactor meltdown there, uh, a community network of technologists and activists came together to build a $99 radiation counter, um, detector and counter, because they didn't trust the information that the, uh, that the government was releasing about where the radiation had spread to. Their organisation is called Safecast. Um, they continue on today. Um, it was an amazing response to a problem, a very real problem, uh, that I think showed the potential of prototype technology for really, really serious problems. Um, John's work is kind of wonderful in terms of spreading tech, um, you know, technological um, capacity and I'm kind of excited to see what kind of comes up in the next few years. But the Tau Centre's report coming out at the end of this month <laughs> will have many more. And <laughs> Thank I'm you for it. the opportunity to plug. <laughs> we'll be promoting it all over the Centre's website, so just wait with bated breath. John, any more you'd like to add in? Um, I, uh, along the same lines, during the Beijing Olymp Olympics, the AP brought in, so it snuck in, um, uh, air quality detectors, uh, very high grade, expensive air quality detectors, um, and was able to show uh, that the air quality for the athletes and people living in Beijing was much worse than what the government was saying. Um, and they had photographs to sort of back it up and uh, compared it to cities around the world and different, um, you know, whether, how, how it compares to New York and London at, you know, in, on the smoggiest, sort of most polluted days. Um, and uh, that, I mean, that was just amazing work. Um, and now those sensors that can do some of that work can, again, just be held in the palm of your hand. And, and some of them are getting down to the $100 level and even cheaper. So then you, you open up the possibility of saying, oh, well, could we distribute a bunch of these uh, over a wider area, not just the one place where the reporter is or walks around, but can we distribute them over a wider um, you know, neighborhood or city. Um, and so th that, to me, was one of the things that really got, it gets me thinking about what's possible. Right, and Tom Kent, AP Standards Editor, talks about the tremendous discussions they had. It, this wasn't just, hey, let's hide some sensors on our cameras as we fly into um, China, but they really thought about that, but, you know, and explored some of the ethics that people have discussed about hidden cameras, and so some of those traditional ethics were playing in there. I would add that I think, um, I don't know if there's such a if there's such an ethic as journalistic hard work, but I would point to um, projects where you may be able to get some um, data by scraping, like some public health data in some states, um, and then in other states you have to do the really hard work of open records requests and logging the data yourself. You know, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel has a phenomenal series called Deadly Delays about um, how just even slight lapses in um, delivery time of uh, infant newborn samples to public health labs can end up delaying treatments that would save children's lives. And in some places, they were able to get that data fairly easily, and in other places, they were having to wrestle out um, PDF documents through open records requests. And so I think that that's a really positive example of staying committed to a story even when the data defy you. So at this point, let me open it up for questions. People have questions they'd like to ask. Hi, um, uh, this is great to hear about. Um, I was wondering, um, in terms of the sensor uh, journalism and, and looking at all of these different projects, you know, as a uh, as just in terms of traditional journalism, there's a you know sensor issues in terms of using a recording device. You're not uh, permitted in certain states to use a recording device, and therefore, uh, without the permission of, of the other party, in some states and some par uh, states you don't need. Are there any laws that you're tripping over um, in your projects, and or creating? Are there any are there any attempts to create new laws to kind of uh, stop you from doing <laughs> doing anything? Any of the, these interesting projects? Sure, and this really comes up. I think uh, the ethical issues of unattended sensors, right? And so. Um, where the notion being that instead of either uh, people tracking their own sleep or even wearing uh, either a handmade thing or, uh, or a Fitbit or something like that, that's one level, right? So, and then with something like cicadas, there are people going into their own yards and taking their temperature. So then the question is, all right, 
what if we want to keep track of something? Um, and um, we're, when we're not there, uh, this goes to my theoretical wish it could happen, subway heat experiment. Um, I think that um, when it comes, I am definitely not a lawyer and consult the lawyers often um, for things like this. Um, I think my, my reading, and Fergus probably has more to say on this, is that a lot of the law is not even close to being able to deal with what we're talking about, right? Um, the, the, there's something about, on one hand, there's something about you know, conversation if you're uh, surreptitiously recording somebody or using a phone line. There's all sorts of different laws that we're, have been, um, cases have come up about them. We understand the landscape, we get it. Um, but if you're saying, oh, okay, well, um, I can actually know um, right now, in fact, I was doing it earlier, I could scan the um, signature, there's a, there's a code that all of your cell phones are broadcasting right now to try to get on the Wi-Fi system, and I can actually read that, right, on my computer, and I did it earlier. Um, and I found mine, I found Ferguson's, it worked. So I could also then, if you imagine, if I capture all those, then I could say, well, next week's conference, I could figure out how many, how many of you were there, and maybe I could actually figure, start to figure out who you are. Oh, and then you went into this store down the street, and I had a little sensor there, too. And now somebody who was here was over there. And pretty soon, you can start to figure out who that is. I don't know if there's any sort of law that would apply to my ability to do that. Um, and I'd be interested to hear about it. My guess is that there isn't, because who's really thought about that? Um, other than, I mean, there are a lot of companies who are thinking about those kinds of things. Um, I think that um, we're in a lot of uncharted territory, and now I'm turning it over to Fergus, who's actually been researching this. <laughs> um, John's absolutely right. There, there, there are plenty of ways that you can kind of do the wrong thing, but there's not a lot of legislation that clearly, um, that clearly governs this. And of course, in a country as big and complex as America, it's, it's different state by state. Um, Again, a plug for a forthcoming book, which will be out in the, in the, in the next month or so. Um, we've broadly identified kind of four categories of, of, of areas of, of law. Um, one's the privacy and surveillance, and you've kind of got the, well, this is what you should do, and then there's, and, um, and then there's the, this is what the law says that you can do. Um, and I am not a lawyer, and this is not the right place to try and kind of go through all of those, because it's just too <laughs> complex here. Um, then there's a kind of set of laws around the kind of building and acquisition of, of this stuff, and that deals in, in large sense, sorry, with the building and acquisition of sensors of the technology itself. Um, and that's normally, those are normally IP concerns, licensing concerns, um, and also interference with things like the FCC's governing of radio waves and making sure that you're not accidentally stopping somebody's pacemaker or, or the, you know, it's. There, because of the physicality and the technology side of this, there's a whole lot of stuff that journalists aren't really used to thinking about. It's difficult, it's annoying. Um, the operational risks often are often um, concerned with the physicality of these things. Um, you know, journalism organisations are used to the fact that if you put a camera truck out there and it, and it runs over something, then, then we can... We, we know the law around that, we can assure around that. So, so it looks like that kind of body of law, um, and, or you know, a drone falling on somebody's head, um, for example. Um, and then there's, the, then there's the law around the kind of accuracy, accuracy and interpretation stuff, where you're kind of making sure that you haven't accidentally defamed somebody. Um, and so those are the buckets, and we think that we can, at this stage, kind of help people identify the questions that they need to have conversations with their lawyers about even if we can't say, because Deirdre Sullivan, who's been helping us out with this stuff, she's the counsel at the New York Times, senior counsel at the New York Times, she keeps on saying, all of this kind of stuff is very, very specific to the facts of your case. So identify the, identify the field, ask the questions of your lawyers. And if I could add one thing to that, I think probably the bu busiest area for state legislatures right now is the restriction of drones. We've got 20 some odd states with um, either passed or soon to be passed legislation. Wisconsin has, um, has a pending bill in this area. And there was a call this morning for more 
full-throated news media defense of openness and access and um, shutting down surveillance. I would say a lot of state press associations, um, newspaper associations, broadcast associations have been caught a little flat-footed, mm -hmm. um, not knowing that legislation was, was out there until it was passed. And you can read in a lot of these um, bills exactly who got ticked off about exactly what. Um, so Texas um, protecting against um, environmental advocates using drones to try to suss out dumping of um, waste in waterways. And you know, Colorado even has legalized shooting a drone out of the sky <laughs> so, in, in defense of your property. <laughs> so um, I think it's time for news organizations and their associations to maybe be more forward thinking about all of these kinds of legal developments and, and having a voice for representing the public. So, oh, hello. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> drones aside, uh, sensors are being baked into many, many more places. And if anyone's following the smart cities discussion, you know that uh, they're now being integrated into many different parts of cities without often people's awareness. If you haven't seen it, the New York Times did a really good story on the Newark Airport um, mm -hmm. having new LED lights that went in that actually had sensors that were motion tracking everyone that passed around there. Now, the community didn't get a vote on that. That's going to be true in many other places. So the first question is, um, to what extent are news organizations using FOIA to try to get what's in those sensors? Is there actually any established norms? Or kind of how is that being pushed forward in terms of people pushing to say, hey, this is public infrastructure. We should have an awareness of what's going into that and using it. And um, then the second, which goes to the question that was previously asked, um, often people argue if something said in public, like at a journalism conference, it's being live streamed to the internet, low internet, um, it's recordable. Um, if something uh, can be sensed or scraped, is it also on the record? And this obviously came up recently with a, a hacker who pulled data that was on the public AT&T site and then was prosecuted and then of course that was recently dismissed, but the point still stands. If it's public online, is it scrapable? So with, with respect to the first um, part of your question, which was about pulling data from these networks of sensors that are being deployed by various organisations and governments, um, the Sun Sentinel example, which I talked about briefly at the start, um, they won a Pulitzer for it. It was wonderful. They, they, they needed to show that cops were speeding and they, and they uh, grabbed the toll booth data from, um, from the highway system. Florida has... Um, two things that allowed that to happen, two things in particular that allowed that to happen. Um, one was that Florida's culture, by and large, is pretty friendly to public records, more so than a lot of other states. Um, the other thing was that their toll booth system, their, their highway system, is publicly owned. Uh, had that story been something that journalists were investigating in another state, they might have run up against the fact that their highways, which feel like public infrastructure um, were in fact public-private partnerships. So, the, so that data would be private. Or they might, have had, um, they might have had a less friendly culture towards public records requests. So, you know, there are, and in, in Washington you've got, you had um, the Washington Post successfully foiling the shot spotter data. Um, we've been trying to negotiate with um, a government in New Jersey to release, because the shot spotter system's rolled out in hundreds and hundreds, well, tens of cities around, around America that's, that are public. Um, we've made a lot of FOIA requests for that kind of data and haven't been particularly successful. But that's the case with a lot of FOIA requests. So th that's the first part of your question. These networks are out there. Your ability to get them is dependent on a lot of factors, including economic stuff and cultural legislative stuff. What was the second part of the question? It wasn't for me. Well, did Definitely any of you want to address me. that first part? That, um, you know, are there data sources that we're failing to recognize, that sense data sources that we're failing to recognize, or do you find news organizations like ProPublica going for that whenever they can see it? I'm trying to think of an example of if we've tried to FOIA for sensory data, and I'm not sure that I can think of any just with our projects. We've, we've certainly FOIAed for data that perhaps a federal agency has obtained in that way, but it's not because we said, we know that you have this sensor, we want that sensor's data. 
It's more like, uh, you know, we know that you have data about flood levels, right? We want that data. We want the endpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but I would definitely think, I mean, it's definitely something you could try to FOIA for. Um, I don't know that I have an example of us doing it, though, that way. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. There's the, the gunshot data mm -hmm. somebody was mentioning before is um, there are some companies who create this, basically they try to triangulate for police departments, triangulate where the gunshots are happening using very sophisticated microphones. Um, and I know folks have FOIA for that and gotten mm -hmm. information um, there. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we were talking at the table earlier that not only do we, does that um, provide the possibility of more data to FOIA and find out, and what are you going to use, what are the cities using it for, and then what might journalists use it for? There's still all of those questions, and then also challenging um, maybe the uh, city's use of that data. You know, how are they using it, or how are they, or is it being abused? That's something to know and understand, and mm -hmm. to do that, you're going to have to figure it out. Um, uh, but also this whole notion that governments are using more technology to, you know, every, everything has an IP address now, you know, your refrigerator has an IP address, your phone mm -hmm. does, whatever. So what does that mean for, the, uh, for being surveilled, this is again flipping it back, but, you know, when, if a document is encoded with the fact machine or the copy machine that um, made the facts or copy, what does that mean for your sources? Those are other things. There's a, a lot of that sort of ubiquity that we're going to have to be considering. And I'm going to transition to the second part of um, Alex's question, which is, if it is public, is it ethically scrapable? Is that a, a reasonable paraphrasing? And I'm going to tie these two together and say that one thing I have seen a little bit more of is journalists using um, private, uh, non-governmental sensed data, especially in breaking news. So um, a um, an explosion at a mall, um, reporters uh, going and using apps that were, you know, sent not exactly Foursquare, but where people check in, um, journalists becoming aware that some Twitter data that you can scrape has actually, I think it's um, about 5% of Twitter data that you can scrape um, has actual uh, longitude and latitude <laughs> coordinates. So uh, and the person who taught me that showed me a tweet and, and was able to identify not just where uh, that I was in my house, but where I was in my house <laughs> from that, that's how specific it was. So I do think there are, there's more journalistic recognition um, that that is out there. I think it's critical that we have conversations about the ethics of that, especially in terms of privacy. We have um, users of social media who see this as quasi-private. They don't necessarily view that as public, and journalists have to engage in these conversations about what that means. You know, privacy is what you know, ethically gives me my unique humanness, right? And if, if all of a sudden we're scraping that and at a distance, not thinking about what that means to the individual, it, it could become a huge problem and, and blow back as well. Anything you guys want to add to that? If it's public, it's scrapable. Well, I don't think. I, I actually just tweeted around in response to Alex's question. Um, <laughs> a, 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 sort of a checklist that another journalist has put together uh, for an earlier conference about questions to consider before scraping and things like, do you, you know, is, is, is the URL of the thing you're scraping sequential or do you have to come up with a random number generator to get the responses out? Things like that to consider. Um, it's not a legal guide, but it's, some, it's sort of a journalist guide. It's a pretty awesome little list of things to consider. And we'll add that to our yeah. lasting resources. I think it's, it's a very complicated question because your whole mindset about it also changes depending on who you're scraping, right? So you can think about someone, let's say they have a public account on Twitter and uh, you take one of their tweets and you broadcast it, right? And you as a news organization has a lot more followers, but the sort of inherent nature of like Twitter is to retweet or if you have a private account, you could make it so that I can't see it. Um, but there are other things like, uh, you know, when I feel like right after Instagram came out, I think I was a part of this. I was at the Wall Street Journal at the time. But there was a lot of like, you know, this is an event. Now let's, you know, stream all of the images out of Instagram that are tagged with certain words. Um, and I don't think, you know, Instagram made as such a big deal as Twitter did at the beginning with like, do you want your account to be public or private? Um, because it was like less users, right? And it was just less public in general. Um, and all of that was just, you know, reprinted as is, wasn't changed in any way. Uh, but we see that with a lot of social coverage of events now, right? It's like all of this stuff just suddenly shows up on a news website 
Um, some of it is opt-in, which is what we try to do at ProPublica now, which is like, if you want to be a part of this, use this particular hashtag. So that changes the relationship a little bit. But on the other hand, right, there are government agencies that make things available on their site, right? So that's public in the sense that it is on the internet. But let's say they don't link to it anywhere on the site where if you just went to the URL, right? But it is up, right? So if you knew the exact URL, you could get to it. Is it okay for me to use that information, right? And I would argue yes, because you are one, a government agency, and two, it is on the internet. Um, but it becomes very different, right? It feels very different when all of a sudden, let's say I'm investigating a specific person, their private, not celebrity status individual, and let's say their website has something like this on it, right? Like my personal website, I have a lot of files up that are publicly accessible because I used to link to them, and I don't anymore. It feels much more like an invasion of privacy in that case if I discover a URL and then I suddenly publish it or write about it or show it or reproduce it, right, compared to a government agency. So it is, it's tricky. Mm -hmm. Very it, complex. The, I, I've uh, said before, and I'll say again, I think that journalism needs more journalists who can code. And part of that has been for me um, that folks like CC can go in and use code and data to find and tell and ex expose stories. The other thing about it is that if you have journalist coders, and, and I'm highlighting the journalist part of this, you're also dealing with people who are journalists who are following an ethical code that fits that organization's journalism. And then when you run up against these questions about is it ethical to sense this thing or is it ethical to scrape that thing, the ethics of the the journalistic organization are part of that person's understanding, which may be different than somebody who's not trained as a journalist, maybe trained to do something else, and where that would be less of an ethical issue. Um, and it's, or, or more of an ethical issue, who knows? Um, but I think that that's actually a side corollary to that notion that, um, that the journalist programmer is a key part of what the future of journalism looks like. All right, well, I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions because I want to give um, all due respect to our breakout session leaders. So first, let me say thank you to our panelists for a fascinating, absolutely fascinating session, and thank you for your work. Yeah.